Hi guys, I'm Bryn Ripley, otherwise known as Brynner's Music, and I am a professional saxophonist. So, today I'm answering a lot of questions. I get questions all day, every day. Um, a lot of them in my <laughs> comments, a lot in my DMs, in person. And I do my best to answer all of them, but you guys got some really good questions. So I'm not gonna pretend like I know all the answers, but I am gonna just speak from my experience. So let's get started. All right, so if you guys haven't yet already, I recently did a podcast episode with my bestie, Michaela Hess, and her podcast is called The Joymaker Pod cast. So uh, I answer a lot of questions on there and kind of talk about my life story. So if you haven't already listened to it yet, go listen to it and then come back to this. So for that podcast episode, I put on my story a questionnaire, just kind of like an open-ended, what questions do you have for me? And I got a lot of responses and I have taken a second to actually record this because of some things going on my, in my life, but I am excited to answer all of your deep, dark questions today. So we'll get started. Okay. Uh, first question is from hearts for underscore gabs. Guys, I'm going to do my best to pronounce your usernames, but I can't promise anything. Uh, how long have you been playing sax? So I have been playing since I was 12. But I was raised with surrounding music. Um, so it's been 11 years, which is crazy. I started in sixth grade and I'm now in like eight millionth grade. I'm finishing up my last year at BYU. So it's been a wild ride. Um, let's see. Underscore dot sai he. That's the best I can go with. Says, hi, Bryn. Can you share your practice routine to get a better sound? Yes. I have had a different practice routine through the years. So it changes um, kind of just based off of what I'm trying to focus on at that time. I'm going to try to give you guys like a beginner, intermediate, professional, you know, separate practice routine. So at the beginning, I think it's really important to focus on building sound and just getting comfortable with the sax. Um, I tell all my students, if you don't have a good sound, but you're really good about everything else, nobody's going to want to listen to you. And it's harsh, but it's true because tone is the biggest thing. So getting started on your tone right away, transcribing right away, like all those things and building up music theory knowledge. So learning your scales and just getting your fingerings down and, and learning how to read rhythm and read music, read notes. So that's kind of what I started with. I did a lot of transcribing at the very beginning and I did a lot of just like basic theory practice. So that was beginner me. And I would say like 30 minutes, five days a week. You know, it's consistency is always way more important than, you know, getting in three hours just once a week. Like if you could do even 15, 10, 15 minutes a day, that's always going to be better than just like a big bulk one day of the week. It's just it's how your brain works. It's going to build things up a lot quicker, a lot faster, and it'll be a lot less painful in my humble opinion. So uh, for intermediate, that's when I started to practice about two hours every day. Granted, I do most of my practicing during the summer. Don't come for me, y'all. I just, the summer's the best time, especially when you're in high school. I know a lot of my followers are older, um, like not not like really old. Sorry, guys. I know you're not super old. Just I have some students or sorry, followers that are in high school or junior high, whatever. But then I also have like 
people that are like already in their careers and working. So you got to find something that works for you. Obviously, if you're working full time, it's going to be hard to practice two hours every day, but it does require a lot and it kind of sucks. But work ethic combined with natural talent, that's how you go places. So I started doing two hours every day during the summer after my eighth grade year. And then during that time, I would just do like 30 minutes of warm ups or sight reading and then 30 minutes of, well, I do 30 minutes of warm ups, 30 minutes of sight reading, 30 minutes of improv and 30 minutes of transcribing every day. And then I bumped it up to four hours in high school. And then I did, you know, all of that plus like 45 minutes of flu, 15 minute break, 45 minutes of clarinet and all that stuff. Um, so those are my practice. That's the practice routines I've been doing. Um, right now it looks different for me because I am kind of prioritizing some different things. I still play a lot. I gig a lot. I teach a lot. Um, and I record a lot of videos. So I'm playing all the time. I pull out the horn almost every day. But I don't have as much time to just like sit and grind it out. And I'm more focused on building my social media and building, you know, my like networking and gigging and all those things and teaching. And so I'm working on building my businesses. Um, so right now it's not my as much of a priority to build my playing up. I feel pretty comfortable with where I'm at and I I'm not practicing for hours every day anymore. Um so take that as you may. I know some people have so many opinions on it. That's just been my experience. That's what I've seen work well for my students, but consistency is the best practice routine you can ever do. But focused around transcribing transcribing everyone that is very important and improvising for those of you who don't know what transcribing is learning by ear it really will change everything so that brings us to as Kevin <laughs> uh underscore they said how to change the sound to pop, meaning their tone, if I have a classic, meaning I'm guessing classical sound. So I'm probably going to sound like a broken record, guys, but transcribing. You are what you listen to. And if you are not listening to jazz or, or pop or funk or whatever you're wanting to sound like, it's going to be so, so hard to actually get that tone that you're looking for or get the melodies that you're trying to build up. And so I wanted to sound like Eric Marienthal at the beginning. And so I transcribed a lot of him. And then I wanted to sound like Kenny Garrett and I transcribed a lot of him. And then I wanted to sound like Candy Dolfer and I transcribed a lot of her. So it's just who you transcribe. So if you're wanting a better classical sound, go transcribe like Eugene Rousseau or like other classical saxophonists if you're wanting a pop sound go transcribe the tenor player of 1975 he's incredible or you know just all these people that have what you want find it copy and paste into your own playing and and you'll be so surprised it's really magical so okay Parker M. Polin said what's the end game meaning like your ultimate musical goal. So that is a great question. And I have struggled to answer that um, for a while. And even, believe it or not, a couple of years ago, I wanted to quit saxophone and I almost did. Um, I think right now where I'm at is I would love to just keep doing what I'm doing on social media. I think it's so fun. I love it. And I would love to just make a living off of this, which I feel like I've been told a lot, like, that's really hard to do. And it is. And so 
I would love to just like provide for myself and my family and just make money doing what I love. And I think that would be so cool and so fun. I would love to also go on tour with a lot of people and perform with a lot of people and specifically tour and perform and record with my husband who's my partner in crime and we actually have a band together called candid so you guys should check that out check it out it's really fun so another one desi millet underscore one two three all right perfect thank you desi favorite memory playing music at BYU okay uh for those of you who don't know I am finishing up my super it feels very very super super senior year at BYU and it's been a wild five years I a lot has happened in those five years and a lot of good things and a lot of bad things and I have lots of opinions Um, my favorite memory though, was going on tour with the top band synthesis, uh, to jazz at Lincoln center in New York and competing with, I believe it was like 15 or 20 other collegiate big bands, like the best in the nation. And I, out of two people there, one, so me and one, me and one other person, one, like outstanding alto saxophonist. So it was really cool. It was a really awesome experience. And I got to go up and like shake Wynton Marsalis's hand and, and I just love New York too. And so it was, it was awesome. It was great to be able to stand out in, dare I say, a big room of men. <laughs> so it was awesome. Um, okay. Sophie underscore Bolanos underscore ND. How can I improve my improvisation in jazz? Any tips? All right, y'all. I got so many questions about this, like a lot. And this seems to be the question of the hour of the year of all time. Improv is hard. But not because of the reason I think you guys think I'm going to say. It's hard to let yourself sound bad. And I have found oftentimes with my students that I turn on a backing track and maybe it's just a blues. And I'm like, okay, just play whatever you want. Play. And they won't. And I'm like, you got this. You can do it. I'm not going to judge you. Just play whatever you want. And they're too scared to sound bad. And I think that holds people back so much. Um, When you're learning to walk or learning to talk, you're not just going to (laughs) only... Little baby you is not going to only walk until you can jog. Or little you is not only going to talk until you can speak full sentences or write an essay. You know, it's... it's, You're going to sound bad. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. It's all these things. And it stunts people a lot, I think, from being able to sound the best they can. That being said, there are a lot of tips I can give you guys, but that's the number one. Number one tip I would give you is don't be afraid to sound bad. And in fact, maybe even try to sound bad. Improv is a journey of learning how to express yourself and it's a new form of communication that is going to take time. So just know that, first of all. My next piece of advice would be to (laughs) transcribe, (laughs) but also understand the theory behind it. Um, Chord progressions move in a specific way. And it's really beneficial when improvising to know what's going on. So I would put the horn down and dive into the theory and understand what a 2-5-1 is, understand what an altered chord is, understand all these different things within jazz 
uh, chordal theory that may see um, may seem overwhelming, but will allow for you to be able to improvise in a way that you know what's going on. You know where the chord progression's heading. You can hear it. And those are skills that you got to build up. But then also learning a lick that you like and then transcribing it in all 12 keys. Because if you can get a lick in all 12 keys, you have something to say in all 12 keys. And that's pretty big. So those are kind of my basic things. So to recap, let yourself sound bad. Understand jazz chordal theory. Three, learn licks that you like in all 12 keys. Okay? Those are some basic tips I'll give you. Oh, and I would get into lessons. It's really, really hard to learn this on your own. I wouldn't be able to. So, um underscore jackson olson said what is your favorite thing about music well jackson let me tell you i love music so much it is one of my favorite things on earth besides my husband and my family and my friends and my cat and all those other things but i just it's been part of my life ever since i can remember my dad is a saxophonist My brother's a drummer. My mom's a vocalist. My two sisters are vocalists. It's just, it is my life. And so I grew up surrounded by jazz specifically, but then I also have just grown to love music as an art form in general. I mean, there's a reason that I married a musician (laughs) It and I'm in a family of musicians and I'm becoming a music, like I'm a professional musician, like It's because it is so at the core of my identity as a person and how I view the world. And I love pretty much every genre of music and I listen to music all the time. The other day, one of my students asked me if I ever listened to anything other than big band music or jazz. And I was like, yes, (laughs) like... I listen to everything. And right now I'm actually like really into more kind of indie pop. Like that's mainly what I'm listening to right now. And then I go through phases of listening to jazz and like lo-fi and like all these different things. And my favorite artist of all time is John Mayer. You know, it's just there's so many different levels of like soul music that I have just like connected to and what has helped me get through my life. So it's kind of hard to put into words how much I love music, but that would probably be it. My favorite thing about music is that it's who I am and it's a beautiful part of art and life and I can't function without it. So Marcos Paulo 3582 says, have you ever played in a jazz band or have you ever thought about being in a band? (laughs) Well, yes. And that is 99.99999% of what I've done for the past decade. I grew up playing in a big band. Like I think within the year that I started um, playing saxophone, I joined my dad's program, which is an after-school program for 12 to 18-year-olds in um, Utah to come and be in a big band or a pop band or all these different things. And it seriously, that program changed my life. And so I got to tour and perform and record and do all these incredible things and work with all these incredible artists starting at the age of 12. And it was all in big bands. And it was so cool. And I mean, I got to be a really good lead alto player. (laughs) And then I played in big bands in college and now I'm also still playing in a big band and it's pretty much all I do. Um, So yes, I I have played in many in high school and junior high through my dad's program, through just gigging professionally. It's very fun. Uh, 
T Grooves. Shout out to T Grooves. I love you. Have you found your voice on the sax? If so, where did it come from? I think so. I think I'm a constantly changing person. So it's hard to be like, this is my voice forever. But I do think so. Um, I think it came from a lot of different places. I think my voice is a combination of listening to my dad growing up. I think it's a combination of my personality. I'm just an extroverted, loud, bubbly person. I think it came from all the people I transcribed. Michael Brecker, Kenny Garrett, Eric Marienthal, Cannibal Adderley in particular. Um, I think it came from a lot of places that I kind of took pieces of all these influences in my life and created my own. But that's ever-changing. Like, I think my sound could change in the next five years or 10 years as I learn new things and I become a different person and, and I go through different phases of my life. So it's hard to be like, this is my voice forever. But I will say I have found my voice for now. So this is becoming long. I apologize, everyone. I'm hurrying it up. What are the best budget mouthpieces and reads by Yanula underscore V. All right. Uh, I am a Jody Jazz fan through and through and through and through. I love them so much. And I've pretty much only ever been playing on Jody Jazz mouthpieces. I love their Jet. I think it's a really good mouthpiece for a really good price. And I really like their um, DVHR. That just came out. I'm obsessed with that one. They sent me one for my tenor and so good. So that's who I would suggest. They're incredible. For reads, I like Select Jazz. I also think Boston Sax Read Shop is great. So those two are kind of my go-to. Um Dizolajida. I think I got that. Uh says, what is it like to be an influencer saxophonist? That is a good question. I don't really consider myself to be an influencer, I guess. Um, This has all been exponentially growing in the past year, specifically, even just in the past six months. And I just kind of see myself as like maybe a creator, but I wouldn't really consider myself like an influencer if that makes sense it doesn't feel like that title fits me very well um but I do love it I really do feel like I'm living my dreams and I really appreciate everyone's support and love and and that you guys enjoy hearing what I have to say so anyways I love it I think social media has allowed for me to reach a platform I never would have been able to um, and be able to share my music with the world in a way that I never thought I could do. I mean, it's been honestly incredible, and I hope to get to do this forever. So I guess along with that question, Magalon.Sean asked do you want to become a famous saxophonist um short answer no I I don't want to just be like I wouldn't say I want like a career doing like solo performances and like go on tour promoting albums of my own and and all that I just want to do all of it and I think Social media is kind of where I can have my own platform and post my own music and do all that. But I wouldn't say that I'm like, I want to just be a famous saxophonist. I think I more just want to create and do a lot of cool things and be a rock star. But um, yeah, so maybe not like in the conventional way of being famous, I guess. So. Uh, 
Extreme Tony said, how did your support system affect you as a musician? Um, that was everything. I mean, my parents pushed me a lot as a kid and being a musician ain't cheap and they paid for everything and it was really awesome and paid for all my lessons and paid for all the tours I went on and um and I mean my dad also like was the one who provided a lot of the opportunities that I did too and so I mean it, it is the reason that I am a musician today I mean if I hadn't done my dad's program the sound house I would not be doing music professionally and I think a lot of people that have gone through the sound house would not be doing music professionally if they hadn't gotten those experiences early on um my husband Carson is also another reason that I do everything I do and he is my biggest supporter and my best friend and my partner and um I mean he set helped set things up so I could record today like he's he's the best so I definitely couldn't do what I'm doing without like the faith and support of my family and my husband so okay underscore Amy Mendoza I think I got that right said did you ever have stage fright if so how did you lose that fear let me tell you let me tell you Yes, I had such bad stage fright and I actually have struggled with severe anxiety and OCD all throughout my life with in several different categories or areas of my life. But stage fright for the longest time, mainly all throughout junior high and high school, was really hard for me. And I threw up before every single performance for several years, which sucks I mean, it was horrible. I got over by doing it. I mean, I feel like there's no other good way of saying it except exposure therapy. And you just do it over and over and over and over and over again. And also accept that worst case scenario, you do so badly and it doesn't matter. You know, it's like the worst case scenario is really not that bad if you think about it. I mean, I know saying that people are like, what? But I mean, I've performed for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And I do get still nervous, but I don't know. You got to, I think having trust in your capabilities too, and like confidence in your own playing and being prepared makes a huge difference. Like if you know, okay, I've done all that I can. I've, you know, I've worked really hard for this. I, I'm confident in what I can play. Then it's like there's nothing else you can do. So I just did it over and over and over and over again. And that's kind of how I got through it. So, okay, I'm going to do a couple more, guys. Um, Any tips for getting gigs as a reed player? And I've also had several questions about this, like getting gigs. Um... Obviously, networking is going to be your best friend. I think people that are hiring, as someone who also hires out musicians for gigs and does that all, all the time, I call people who I like a lot. I rarely ever call, like, the absolute best person. If you're a good hang, you're going to get gigs. If you are fun to be around and a good player, everyone's going to want to work with you. If you suck as a person and you're really good, you're not getting gigs. I mean, that's how it is. So make friends. Be fun. Like, be professional. Like, with the gigs that you do have, do the best you can. And then reach out to more people and be like, let's play together. Like, just build your community and... With that, people know about you and they want to work with you and they like you as a person and you'll be surprised how quickly things start rolling in or word of mouth and all that. I mean, social media is great, too. I've gotten a lot of gigs through social media, um, so that doesn't hurt in the slightest. Okay, so last one. I'm excited for this. 
at okay you gomez s says do you see yourself releasing a solo album i actually think i'm gonna release an ep in the next like three-ish months i'm starting to record things right now and i'm so I'm so excited guys because I've had a lot of videos go viral and a lot of people ask me when I'm gonna put the music out and so I'm excited to finally put some music out for you guys that you can actually stream and not just have to watch on TikTok or Instagram so um some of it are like some of the EP um are gonna be original songs and some of them are just gonna be jazz standards but I'm so excited and I will have more to come on that subject. So, well, thank you everyone for all your support and love and sticking through this video. And hopefully I was able to answer some of your questions. And if you have more, please DM me. I try to get back to everyone that I can or leave a comment. And yeah, so let me know if you guys want me to do this again. Bye!